Good evening, and welcome to the annual meeting of Jewish Residential Services for 2021. I'm Lori Rabin, the board chair of JRS. I'm very excited about our theme tonight, the power of relationships. With that in mind, we'll also be updating you on what we've been up to this year. So that we all understand what JRS is about, I will read you our mission. I don't want to miss a word, so I'm going to read it. JRS supports individuals with psychiatric, developmental, or intellectual disabilities, helping them to live, learn, work, and socialize as valued members of the community. Some statements also include the word thrive, and so I'll add that. I like the word thrive. Um, I've been involved with JRS for a number of years. From the start, I've always had my Aunt Ruthie in mind. You see, Aunt Ruthie was different. She had what we now call bipolar disorder. As a kid, I would sneak out of my room at night to listen to my family puzzle over what to do about her unusual behavior. I was so curious. So curious, I became a psychologist, but that's another story. I knew she lived alone. She was isolated. Sometimes she had a friend, and she couldn't work. I knew she suffered. Aunt Ruthie would have loved our Sally and Howard Levin Clubhouse. She would have benefited from our supportive living program. So what happened to Aunt Ruthie? Eventually, she grew old enough to move to what in that era we called an old folks home. It was the Rosa Copeland home in Buffalo, New York. And there she had warm, caring relationships with staff and other residents. It was all good. So let's continue our journey tonight to learn more about the power of relationships and the power of JRS. Let me introduce Nancy Gale, the Executive Director of JRS. Thank you, Lori. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Gale, Executive Director of Jewish Residential Services. As Lori said, this year the theme for our annual meeting is the power of relationships for an inclusive community. Creating relationships of mutual understanding and trust with the people we serve makes it possible for us to accomplish our mission. As you'll hear from our guest speaker, Dr. Al Condalusi, it's critically important for people with disabilities to have relationships not just with each other, but throughout our community generally. This helps them thrive in many ways and benefits the community as a whole. This year, we've helped the people we serve to nurture and broaden their relationships due to the pandemic, sometimes under less than ideal circumstances. But most important, we never stop providing services and use new methods to deliver services in order to maintain relationships. For example, our supportive living program kept in touch with participants while keeping them connected to Jewish traditions. When gathering wasn't feasible, we ensured they were regularly seeing a friendly face, even if it was partly hidden behind a mask, by personally delivering almost 150 Shabbat meals over the course of the year. We've continued to offer hybrid programming at the Sally and Howard Levin Clubhouse with in-person or virtual options to help members stay connected and support each other. With a twice daily touch base meeting, Clubhouse colleagues receive support in the way that best meets their needs. That's more than 4,000 hours of hybrid programming and connectedness this past year. Our Families in Transition program recently doubled in size with the opening of the Solomon House on Mount Royal Road. The joy of the residents and their families was evident that May afternoon of the grand opening and the neighbors have been incredibly welcoming. This is a wonderful example of the importance of relationships for both the residents of the community living arrangements and the neighborhoods surrounding them. Programming for the Jewish Outreach Initiative, or JOY, the program we run jointly with Friendship Circle, illustrates a pandemic adaptation that enhanced existing relationships. JOY's mission is to bring Jewish programming and connection to persons living in group homes and other supported settings located in and around Pittsburgh so they can participate in the joy of holiday and community observance. Activities have always been challenged by the difficulty the residential facilities face in scheduling transportation. With virtual programming, we made it easier for more people to get involved. 
Our staff delivered almost 90 holiday kits with activity materials and treats over the course of the year, allowing everyone to participate together. I also wanted to mention that in June, the JRS Board approved a three-year strategic plan that will put us on a path for growth. The plan identified five priorities. One, to expand our programs and services, in other words, to serve more people. Two, to establish JRS as a recognized disability inclusion advocate in Pittsburgh. Three, to broaden our fundraising efforts by reaching new audiences. Four, to deepen board member engagement and knowledge. And five, to explore expanding waiver-funded services. In alignment with our goals, we presented several well-attended educational sessions for our participants, their loved ones, and the general public. We're particularly proud of one we organized in partnership with the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh in conjunction with Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month. It featured Matan Koch, Director of California and Jewish Leadership at Respectability. The theme of the presentation was inclusion of people with disabilities in faith communities. In his remarks, Matan noted that inclusion, inclu inclusive faith communities help to create a world where everyone's talents and abilities can be accessed equally. I thank you for your support throughout this challenging year. I am especially proud of how we were able to support our program participants without interruption and adapt our methods of service delivery to ensure the safety of our participants and staff. Speaking of staff, I cannot thank each and every one of them enough for their tenacity, resilience, collaboration, and good humor during the upheaval of the pandemic. JRS is also fortunate to have a wonderful board of directors which has been incredibly wise, generous, and supportive. In closing, I'd like to share a short video from the first issue of Connectability, the inclusion blog we relaunched in August. It highlights the importance of understanding, acceptance, and inclusion, values that are fundamental to JRS. Let's take a look. Through all of this, there have been whispers of revolution. People are starting to talk more openly in Temple about the effects of mental illness in their lives. I know for myself that with each new risk I take and each project I work on, I have experienced nothing but kindness, support, and understanding from my fellow members of Temple Sinai. Ann Alter is a member of the Jewish community who has several mental health diagnoses. I live with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, OCD, and anxiety panic disorder. And those are pretty much lifelong. At age 10, Anne was hospitalized for the first time, and she experienced the stigma that often comes with living with a mental health diagnosis. I recall a peer of mine asking me if it was true that I had been in a mental hospital over the summer, and I lied and said no, because I knew what the, the price for telling that would be. But at age 29, she came to Temple Sinai looking for hope and found an opportunity to spread awareness about mental illness through religion. So there were things that I did on my own, you know, in my earlier life. But I got involved in Temple Sinai, and Mark Kaplan and Lisa Letterer started the Disability Task Force some years back. And Lisa and I started the mental health arm of the task force. And we've been doing projects ever since. We arranged for the staff at Temple to attend training for helping congregates with mental health emergencies. We have presented a program of mental health first aid for young people. Several of us train in stand-up comedy about mental illness and wrote and presented our work at Temple Sinai. And those are only a few of the accomplishments the mental health arm of the Disability Task Force has achieved. With the high holidays quickly approaching, Anne notes from personal experience that it can be difficult for people with mental illnesses and disabilities to attend services. I have trouble with concentration. I have trouble with overstimulation. You know, there's a, the high holidays are very demanding. The high holidays are a time for reflection, new beginnings, and community. Please consider all members of the community and listen to surrounding voices such as Anne's in order to ensure everyone can fully participate during the high holidays and throughout the year. In an ideal world, the Jewish community would understand that two truths about people with mental illness stand side by side. 
One is that we want you to know that we struggle to cope even with the small tasks of daily life. On the other hand, I would like it known that we have achieved remarkable things and will continue to do so. In the end, what we most want from the Jewish community are understanding, acceptance, and inclusion. We want you to respect us. Any Jew concerned about community should embrace this endeavor and get to know us for who we are. Hello, my name is Judy Cohen and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of JRS. Our keynote speaker for tonight, Dr. Al Condalusi, has been a leader in community building, human services, and inclusive advocacy work for the past 50 years. Holding a PhD and MSW from the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Condalusi was the CEO of Community Living and Support Services, or CLASS, a major nonprofit community building organization in Pittsburgh from 1973 to 2019. CLASS offers a multitude of services ranging from independent skills training to community-based case management for social, recreational, and residential supports. He holds faculty status at the University of Pittsburgh in the schools of social work and health rehab sciences, and is the author of seven books, including the acclaimed Interdependence, The Route to Community, and Social Capital, The Key to Macro Change. In 2018, he received the key to the city of Pittsburgh, the highest civilian honor that can be given to a community member. He serves as a consultant, advisor, and human services coach, and is on a number of nonprofit boards and government commissions on state, local, and national levels. He helped found and convenes the Interdependence Network, an international coalition of professionals, family members, and consumers interested in community engagement and macro change. On a personal note, I have known Al for many years, and my son was a participant at class after he graduated from the Children's Institute. He is a passionate advocate for people of all abilities. I hope you enjoy this presentation highlighting the power of relationships for an inclusive community. Thank you, Judy, uh, for that, that kind introduction. And uh, uh, wow, what a, what a wonderful opportunity to be, um, be a part of the Jewish Residential uh, Services um, annual gathering, albeit a virtual uh, experience again for us uh, this year. Um, uh, you know, I, Judy uh, Cohen and I go uh, back a number of years and have worked together as allies um, in, in disability advocacy. And it's just such an honor uh, to be a part of, of this gathering uh, uh, this evening. And, and, you know, my topic is really something that is just so woven into the uh, Jewish Residential Service mission and, 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 and array of services, the great stuff that, uh, that JRS does uh, in, in our community. Um, focusing in on uh, social capital, the bill of the potency of social capital, what it does for us. And, and, and now social capital sounds like a, uh, you know, a big uh, academic concept. And, and actually, it's not. You know, social capital is really quite simply the relationships that we have in our lives. Uh, um, you know, they, they, the sociologists use the term social capital to enrich or to create a greater importance about relationships. So if, 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 you know, if we just said friendships or relationships, people would devalue it. Uh, so, so sociologists' uh, strategic use of the term social capital is really designed to sort of elevate the importance. And I'm going to go over why social capital is so important uh, in our lives. <clears throat> Because relationships bring value to our lives. They, they, they literally uh, support us and, and, and prop us up and enhance um, uh, our, our lives. Um, we're, we're healthier because of our relationships. Um, in fact, we, we often think that, you know, we're health, we're, we're, our health is tied to doctors and, and medicines and and doctors and medicines are important, but the most critical ingredient to better health are relationships. 
are, are people who get you to the doctor or go fetch your medicine for you or, or watch out for you or suggest things uh, to you. Relationships are absolutely tied to life happiness. And we know happiness is really important for any, any of us, all of us, that we have that written into the Declaration of Independence, right? Uh, the pursuit of happiness. And yet happiness and relationships are absolutely correlated um, issues. Um, we know that relationships are, are absolutely foundational to uh, the notion of, uh, uh, of, of achievement and advancement. Um, oftentimes, you know, you think about people, uh, success in, in vocational issues in work issues is not so much tied to what they know. It's more tied to who they know. Um, and, and last social capital has really been now fundamentally tied to longevity, life expectancy, the, that, that we thought the, the key elements to life expectancy and to living a longer life was to, I don't know, get, you know, get a lot of rest and eat well and exercise and don't smoke. And, and all those things are important, obviously, to a quality of life. But, but even more important to longevity is relationships. And in, in social capital, the key concepts are the you know listed here on this slide right interdependence now what's what's really key here is we think that that independence for folks especially folks who have disabilities is really important but more important is interdependence right independence actually in a you know in a nutshell uh, really leads us to isolation from people we're able to do everything on our own we don't need anybody else to help us whereas interdependence is really about the co-relationships uh, between people social influence theory it sounds like a big you know word it, it really is not social influence theory is how our relationships influence us, uh, influence us and affect us and and it's true that if you see somebody that you know and like doing something, you're more prone to do it yourself. Um, so, so the notion of relationships uh, really, really matter. And, and we know with social capital, there's levels of values that we receive. Instrumental value it act basically means when someone does something for you, um, that you gain in that process and you feel that you need to reciprocate with that person. And, and so doing things for people is instrumental value. Emotional value is when, we, when people got our back, when, when you know that there are people you can count on, especially when the chips are done. Um, informational value is just the kinds of things you learn from the people in your life, the people that you are connected with. Now, real, social capital also has intensity levels, right? And what I mean by intensity, um, we have uh, covenant relationships, which are the most tightest relationships in our lives. This is, you know, with our family, our close family and our close, close friends people that we know that will be there for us no matter what. But then there are activity relationships. These are people you do things with, maybe go places and, and, and spend time with, right? And they're your friends, right? But, and then general acquaintanceships are people that you know in your life, that you have a relationship with, um, but, you know, they're not necessarily, you know, your friends. They, people you some, maybe see at work or people you see uh, in the community, you say hello to them, they say hello to you. Those are our general acquaintances. Now, the interesting notion here with social capital is that, that um, uh, sociologists and anthropologists have actually begun to measure social capital. And, and some theorists actually think that the typical person has about 150 important relationships where they have some social obligation uh, to that person. 150, right? I just want to stop and think. You know, when I say that out loud, when I say that publicly in presentations I do, 
and people kind of, you know, scratch their head and they start counting on their hands, trying to think about how many important relationships they have. Um, but, but in reality, if you really sat down and began to gauge your connectedness, you would be amazed at how many relationships you have. But on the contrary, we know that when people um, experience disability, that they have trouble building or even developing, establishing uh, relationships. Um, this happens both with congenital disabilities, that's disabilities that people are born with, intellectual disabilities and cerebral palsy and maybe other kinds of conditions that, that are from birth, as well as acquired disabilities. My dad had Parkinson's and uh, his, he, his Parkinson's was diagnosed later in his life. Um, but after his Parkinson's diagnosis and, and, and his, his uh, manifestation of some of the symptoms, his relationship started to really drift away, right? Uh, people who are born with disabilities have difficulty establishing relationships in the first place. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? However, without friendships, the world is a wilderness, right? Uh, that, that friendships matter, relationships really matter. Now, when we drill down on this and we say, why do people who have disabilities have less relationships, right? Le less connectedness. Um, there's, there's some real reasons that you can flesh out, right? That oftentimes we see disability through a medical lens. And that medicalization of disability leads way to people having to go to the doctors and demand for treatments and therapies and, and, and you know, and, and, and all of that takes time. And when people are separated out from the community um, to going to some treatment or some, some therapy, uh, that's less time that you have to develop friendships. We also know there's fears and stereotypes that people without disabilities have. I, you know, I saw this with my dad, my cousin, Carrie, who had Down syndrome, that people automatically make assumptions when they see a disability. And, and cons consequently, those stereotypes or assumptions will, will, will push people away from each other. Um, even with disabilities, sometimes people get embarrassed. I know with my dad, um, you know, he, he was on, you know, some medicines that were diuretic in nature and caused him to have to, to go to the bathroom a lot. He was always nervous that he might um, wet himself, that he might not be able to control his need to pee or couldn't find a bathroom, right? Um, so so there's, there's some real, you know, things that we could put our, our fingers on related to uh, why uh, people who experience disabilities and even their families uh, are oftentimes separated out and not a part of the of the broader mix. So, so in in my experience, you know, and that, that, as you heard in the in Judy's introduction, you know, I've fifty years, um, you know, in the field with UCP at Pittsburgh and then Class um, uh, as the executive director and and. Um, and, and in, as I think about the interventions that are absolutely essential, and, and not just for people with disabilities, I think it's for, for anyone, is um, how to develop social capital. I think this is true for any of us. I, you know, I have two little grandchildren now, and, uh, and, and you know, my big thing with them is for them to connect with other people, to be able to, you know, build uh, relationships. Um, because social isolation is more debilitating than the disability itself. When people are separated out, when they're isolated, you know, loneliness and isolation are absolutely devastating to any human being, to any of us. Uh, when you're separated out, when you're not a part of the mix, when you have limited relationships, bad things can happen. We know, in fact, there's many people in the United States of America, I dare say around the world, die, die from social isolation. 
as from all smoke-related conditions or illnesses. What this actually, what this quote from Robert Putnam, Harvard sociologist, right, and researcher on social capital, what we have come to know is that uh, that social isolation and loneliness are more lethal than smoking. Right? And yet, you know, smoking, everybody knows that smoking is bad for you and is going to lead to a shorter life. And, uh, and yet, social isolation and loneliness, things that we can get our hands around, um, uh, uh, we, we, we avoid. So Cicero, years and years ago, said friendships make prosperity more shining and lessens adversity by dividing it and sharing it, right? Um, and, and, and friendships and connections to other people really matter. Now here in, in Pittsburgh, we, you know, we know this and, uh, you know, the good folks at, uh, JRS and, and the various services and programs, the great stuff that JRS does, the clubhouse, um, the supported living, uh, program, families in transition, um, um that all of, all of those things at the core of them, relate to friendships. I mean, in, in our community, we have the friendship circle, right? And uh, uh, that, that, uh, that Rabbi uh, Morty um, uh, runs, uh, which is really designed at, at its very core to get people connected with one another. Now, let me, let me say very loud, though, that it's imperative that relationships be diverse, right? That just having people with disabilities have relationships with each other uh, is not enough. That 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 doesn't do what we're what we're looking at in a you know in a thirty thousand foot view here, right? It's relationships with other people, and especially people without disabilities. That really is the critical piece of the puzzle for many many reasons. Uh, it that leads to community change macro change. And so the keys to building social capital are, you know, fairly identifiable, right? There's four steps, and I write about this in some, some books. And if you're interested, take a look at my website. There are some videos on this and, and resources, white papers. But, but these four steps are quite simply one, um, you, rather than focus on what you can't do and what the struggle is and what the disability uh, brings in your life, uh, it's more important to focus in on what you can do and what you enjoy, right? Identifying the affinities that you have in your life. And then number two, find places where people gather and stay connected with people who like what you like. I know with my cousin, Carrie, who had uh, Down syndrome, um, one of the things Carrie really liked was, was photography, right? And, um, and, and so we were able to get Carrie connected to a photography club, not a, not a Down syndrome photography club, not a, not a disability uh, photography club, but it, just a generic photography club, right? Where Carrie was able to make some friends, people who didn't have disabilities were there, right? Um, and, and we had to, as a family, really find ways that we could keep Carrie active with that group, some compensatory sort of strategies and adjustments. Uh, but every community gathering place has rituals and patterns and jargon and infrastructure. And the more we know about that, the easier it is to manage that. And then lastly, recognize the impact of social influence theory. Remember, when you begin to build friendships and connectedness with other people, you start to basically be influenced by what they do, right? And, and, and you know, I write about this in my books as, as, as the, the power of gatekeeping, right? A gatekeeper is somebody who's influential in a community. And when they behave certain ways, other people want to want to behave like that. Right? And so friendship is like jazz, right? It's tough to define, but you know it when you have it, right? From, this is a quote from Miles Davis, uh, you know, about this notion of, of relationships and friendships. And, and, and clearly, with incredible programs like Jewish Residential Service and other kinds of great things that we have in this community, 
Uh, there's no failure except in no longer trying. And I know all of my colleagues at JRS continue to look for ways that people can be engaged and people can be connected. In the end, what we do with our lives individually is not what determines whether we are success. What determines our success is how we affect the lives of others. You know, this is really a powerful quote from Albert Schweitzer. And, you know, when I, when I put this quote up and I use it a lot when I do presentations, because it takes me back to a moment in time uh, with my dad. Right? And this was after my dad, you know, was diagnosed with Parkinson's and um, was uh, his Parkinson's was pretty, you know, pretty, pretty um, challenging. And uh, he de his decline was was pretty swift. And and um, he before too long, he needed really total care. And as a family, we gathered around to, you know, help dad out and to do whatever we could to keep dad as engaged in community as possible. And so one of my, you know, one of the, the things that I contributed was personal care, right? A couple of days a week, I'd give dad a bath and, you know, shave him, make sure he was, he was, you know, comfortable and looked good. And uh, so uh, one, one evening I was giving my dad a bath. We, we were, you know, and we were in the bathtub and I was, I was, you know, washing him up and my dad started to cry. Now, I had seen my dad cry in other situations, but these usually were joyous uh, situations. These were different tears. And, and so I didn't know how to deal with it. I, dad, 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 no crying in the bathtub. What are you, what, what are you crying for? And he said, uh, I didn't want this for you. I said, what? And he said, I didn't want you to have to take care of me. And he said, I should be taking care of you. And I, I said, Dad, I, I said, you did take care of me. And, and, and I'm honored to do this. This is not an imposition. I, you know, I love you. And this is, no, this is not a hardship at all. And, 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 and then he paused and he said, I don't want you to remember me like this. Right? And it, it was a powerful moment, right? I mean, I started to cry as well. And, but, but it, it it, it, it was a, a segue, a perfect segue, because it was my dad giving me the chance to tell him how we feel about him, how I feel about him, how important he was and is uh, to our family. And, and so we had this moment, we embraced, and I told him that, you know, he was my hero and that, you know, obviously, you know, the kind of man I am today is because of the model that he presented to me. And, um, and, and, and and, and, you know, when he passed away, just a couple of weeks after that, he passed away. But uh, I told that story at his, uh, you know, at his uh, uh, funeral mass. And, uh, and, and because when you think about it, when you drill down, life is about moments and moments are captured in relationships. And so I want to thank the folks at uh, Jewish Residential Service, Nancy, and you know all the you know great folks, uh, April and, and and Joe and Allison, Caitlin, and the good folks that do some incredible work. Um, but mostly, I want to thank you for being a part of this resource, for being a part of making our community better. Because together, when we open up our hearts and minds to each other, we create a better community. So I want to thank you very much. I want to thank Judy for the introduction. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the meeting. And, and uh, let's continue to change the world. Thank you. Earlier, I mentioned the Jewish Outreach Initiative, also known as JOY, which provides individuals living in supported settings the opportunity to celebrate Jewish holidays. When Federation approached JRS about taking up the mantle for this program, we immediately thought of the Friendship Circle and invited them to partner with us. Over the past three years, together we have developed dynamic Jewish programming that aligns our shared values of inclusion and community building. For this reason, I am thrilled to present Jewish Residential Services Community Partner Award to the Friendship Circle of Pittsburgh. Hello, I'm Rabbi Morty Rudolph, Executive Director at Friendship Circle. And I'm Paige Eddy, the Adult and Partnerships Coordinator. And we are so grateful to receive the Community Partner Award from the Jewish Residential Services. Um, we 
really value our partnership. Uh, we know that our missions align so perfectly and are completely dedicated to ensuring that our community is a more accessible one and, in, and a properly integrated one for people of all abilities. And know that we share that, share that, those common values together with JRS, together with many of you watching here and are grateful that we live in a community where that is such a priority and such a value. And to Al's point, as, as important as it is for um, members, people with disabilities to have relationships with each other, it's important for all of us as a community to ensure that it's a welcoming one and accommodating one and an accessible one for everybody, regardless of ability. We have been so happy and fortunate to be able to partner with Joy over the past year. We've celebrated Rosh Hashanah by decorating honey cakes. We've gone over the 10 plagues for Passover and made Haroset and held Hanukkah service all online. Nothing brings people together like celebrating the holidays. Though the past year has been challenging for everyone, we have been able to reach about 30 people through our programs, creating lasting relationships between other organizations, including Meriki, Verland, Achieva, and more. We didn't give up on connecting with others. Here at Friendship Circle, friendship is at the core of our values, and we know that it's the same with joy. Thank you, again. Hello, I'm Joe Herbig, director of the Sally and Howard Levin Clubhouse. We thank you for making the work at the Clubhouse possible. In the video that follows, we'll show you what your support means to the Clubhouse members. The lives of these individuals with mental health diagnoses are changed for the better because of it. Let's see how. Clubhouses provide a cost-effective, holistic, and inspiring solution for people living with mental illness. Our member surveys confirm coming to the Clubhouse helps many of them avoid repeat hospitalizations. The Sally and Howard Levin Clubhouse was established by Jewish Residential Services in 2001. It grew out of a vision to provide people living with mental illness an environment to make friends, participate in meaningful work, and to have a community to which they could belong without judgment or reservation. The Clubhouse is defined by its members. It's a place where individuals can come and dictate their own recovery at their own pace. There is a meeting every morning to check in with individuals to see how they're doing. We call this touch base. We also have another one at the end of the day at 2 p.m. to check in on those goals they set for themselves at 10 a.m. Sometimes what happens in between could be anything. It could be working on the newsletter. It could be painting the windows. It could be doing a workshop that focuses on inclusion. It could be going up to the garden and planning. It could be helping an individual find a job. We have three areas in the clubhouse, which we all work on collaboratively. The food and horticulture area is responsible for food preparation, meal prep, our garden, running the snack bar, buying items, and making sure we're eating nutritious meals and providing them at affordable cost for our members. The second is the business and education employment area. This area is responsible for sending out the newsletter, sending out flyers, and also transitional employment. Then we have member services. Member services focuses on planning social events within the community. It's responsible for acclimating individuals back into a fun, supportive, and inclusive environment. The impact that I've noticed that the clubhouse has had on individuals, it's increased their confidence. We have individuals that come in now and want to work. We have individuals that come in and want to be a part of the program. We have individuals that lead their own workshops. We have individuals that lead the accreditation committee. We have individuals that work together collaboratively. And this was something that prior to this was not an option for them. We believe that these options are really what separates the clubhouse from other agencies and what makes us unique. What makes it feel like a community to me is that everybody works together as a group. Everybody has the same what we do. We all make decisions together. It's not one person. The clubhouse means a lot to me. I consider it my second family. More recently, I've become very involved and um, I've been able to tell my entire story, which has been so incredibly healing for me. What I'm finding is that I'm coming back to myself, you know, because I was very outgoing, very involved in the community and on a state level. And I'm so excited that I'm coming back to myself. You know, I feel good. I feel good about being here. I feel 
good about my, my colleagues here, both members and staff, and I'm just really, really grateful that I'm here. So how can you become a colleague here at the Sally and Howard Levin Clubhouse? You can go to our website at shlcclubhouse.org, go through the referral section, and click the member application. Once you have the member application, take that to your healthcare providers and fill it out with them. After that, it will get faxed back to us and we'll give you a call in a prompt, timely manner. Hello, I'm Allison Carabin, Program Manager of the Families in Transition Program at JRS. Thank you for your support this past year. With your help, JRS was able to provide services for some of the most vulnerable members of our community, individuals with intellectual and or developmental disabilities who are eager to assume more independence but need full-time support. Your help has had a positive impact on them as well as their families, loved ones, and the community as a whole. Hello. I'm April De La Cruz, Director of Supported Living Services. Because of your generosity, we were able to provide person-centered services for our participants, individuals who have intellectual, developmental, or mental health disabilities. We help them to achieve their goals and assist them in successful independent living and active participation in the community of their choice. We hope you enjoy seeing how they demonstrated their resilience this year. Thank you. Relationships have sustained us throughout a year filled with stress, upheaval, and in spite of it all, a great deal of accomplishment. I hope what we've presented tonight has provided you with insights into why they're so powerfully important to the people we serve. We want to thank you for taking this journey with us tonight. And I hope you've learned something new and inspiring about the value of acceptance and inclusion. Thank you to our staff, to our board and our supporters, and for all of the individuals we've had the honor to serve. Good night.